Episode 40. Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, Episode 43. And the award goes to... From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of gameplay, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for some more off-the-books after show. For those of you that aren't here live, if you want to hear the audio from those after show chats as well as our uh, new intro where we kind of chat about things before the game gets started, today for some reason was all about basketball uh, and then Detroit commercials. All you got to do is back our Patreon at the $4 level or higher. You also get some other cool stuff like ask access to our Discord channel and some pre-production show notes. Now this week we are talking about Tabletop Gaming Awards. Stick around after the main topic for an OSR module review and a Battlecon game for Tabletop Gaming Weekly. And I've started playing Jaipur, a lot of Jaipur on BGA with Eric. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, whether that's positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now I'm going to start with yet another comment on that Gloomhaven FAQ read through. It seems like we're getting like one or two comments a week on this thing. That thing's kind of, as far as our content's concerned, it's gone viral. <laughs> really. Uh, this is from Scar Bebop. If you wanted to play a single player experience, couldn't you just create new versions of one of your friend's characters and play through a scenario like that? That way, you leave their character intact while being able to experience their class yourself. Well, Scar, the problem with that is there's a couple things. First off, when you play solo, you play two characters. So I would have to mess with two people's characters at this point. Though at this point, Tori has retired a character, so using his would probably be a little better. The thing is, well, you can have multiple groups playing Gloomhaven, and it's one of the things a lot of people don't know about the game. Like, Sean could come down on one weekend, and we could start a whole new party and start continuing on on the same map and playing the same campaign. But to do that, you have to make new characters. The problem with this is, is the record keeping. So... I don't know if you've seen the game, but there's a box that you get with your character and it's got all the cards and your player board. Uh, and there's a little another box with your miniature encounters. But the main thing is, is we keep all our cards in that box, but we keep them sorted. So when you start the game, you have this whole deck of abilities to pick through and you start with all the level one ones and all the X ones. Well, as soon as you level up, you're picking between two cards. So what all of us, all four of us playing have done is separated into two decks, one deck, the cards we own and the other deck of cards we might earn later. Similarly, we do the same thing with our combat deck. So there's a deck that everyone has. It's identical at the start of the game. It's 20 cards. But every time you get a perk, you modify that deck. And in each box is a special class-specific deck. Well, as we played, we've modified that, those decks, right? So we keep our set deck in our box. Lastly, there's all the items we earned. All the items we earned, we put in the box. So now if I came in and made that character, I would have to mess that box up, right? I would have to go and reset it to zero. I would have to put all the items back. I would have to take out all the level up cards. I would have to take all the items out and everything like that and get it back to base and then build my own version of the character. Now, specifically with items, what if I want to buy an item that Deanna's Mind Thief has, not Tori's old character? Now I got to take apart her box and find that item in her deck. And then I got to get it all back for the next time we play. Now, some of this, like the perks are tracked right on your character sheet, but there's nowhere on your character sheet to write down what cards you bought each level go leveling up. So it just, it's a kind of a big mess. So yes, we could do it. But it would so mess up the ongoing campaign. And the game already has a huge setup time. I don't really want to add to that. So I hope that answers your question, Scar Bebop. Now, surprisingly, we didn't get any additional suggestions for games with mechanics similar to Catan. 
I was really hoping that someone would come up with a game with trading, dice space, resource generation, generating and stealing resources from other players. Mm -hmm. eh, maybe that is really the secret sauce that only exists in Catan. That is possible. That could be why it's doing as well as it did. That one of my concerns, though, is maybe no one plays Catan anymore and no one cares. So I decided to do a little experiment. And to that end, I started a poll on Twitter a week ago. Now, this is something I think we're going to start doing every week, probably Wednesday. After I'm done the podcast, I'm going to jump on Twitter and I'm going to throw a poll up. Just watch the at tabletop bellhop one word account. So the question I asked really simple was, do you still play Catan? Any version with or without expansions? 58% of you said yes. So it's good to see at least a small majority of players are still enjoying this classic. This did generate some comments as well. So Board Game Diner wrote, We play Catan every other month or so. We play a mega game with several expansions and some house rules. Catan, Seafarers, Traders and Barbarians, and Oil Springs. Oil Springs I definitely have not tried. I don't even know what that one's in, what expansion that's in. It might be a standalone. Uh, and technically, Traders and Barbarians. I've been doing this too often on the show. Maybe we should reevaluate the pile of shame. There's these games that I bought like long ago before I started piling my games in a pile of shame. Uh, and Traders and Barbarians is one of those. It should probably be on there because I bought it during a sale at Chapters Indigo when there was still chapters in Windsor and not Indigo. And like that, that was probably 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago. And I don't think I ever used any of it, but maybe I did. That's how long ago it was. So Catan uh, is, uh, Oil Springs is Catan Scenarios. So uh, it's, it's actually, a, it's called Catan Scenarios Oil Springs. Okay. So that might be one of the ones that's in DOS book, which I do own downstairs. So it okay. might be that. Moving on, Jacob Chodorowski. Sorry if I pronounce that, or Chordorowski commented, my kids like to play it, so of course I say yes. Now what's interesting about this is that I commented, my kids play Catan Jr. And then Jacob replied that he's actually looking forward to trying Catan Jr., which I gotta say seems a little backwards. I, if my kids were already on Catan, I think I'd skip Catan Jr. It doesn't seem like I would go back to that one. Now... <clears throat> John Evil, or sorry, Evil John noted, yes, we still played varied versions, and it gets a lot of digital playtime as well, and also went on to comment, my iPad is such a welcome refuge for my love of board games. I get terribly excited when I see a new port of an old favorite. Uh, this conversation actually went on significantly longer. I think Sean was part of that one, too. Uh, we went back and forth quite a bit about forced obsolescence in technology, but that's not a conversation I think we need to repeat here. Finally, Nick Culbertson finished us off with It's Still My Favorite Game. Well, thanks everyone for the game suggestions and comments. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that might make it on YouTube. Tonight, we've got uh, Major Kayla, Larry Bird's ball sack, uh, Shadzar's in there, and She Games is in there, and uh, if anyone else is uh, around, do speak up as we're uh, going on throughout the show. I have to assume that's just like the backpack that the ball player carries his sure, big basketball. Sure, absolutely. Like, there's sure. nothing wrong with that. Oh, we do have Shadzar as well. I was yeah, yeah, he's Shadzar, there, yeah, he's there. Very cool. So tonight we're talking about awards. So the big question I've got for our chat room is obviously, do you care? Do awards matter to you at all? Do you pay attention to board game, RPG, uh, whatever type of gaming you are? Do you even know there's awards for tabletop games? I'm sure there's people out there who don't. Um, I'd like to know, do you care? Do you not? Um, if you do care, which awards do you care the most about? Are there ones you don't care about? We'll be back checking in with the chat room throughout the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works as well. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop One Word. Now, the best way is to go through the website. That way I don't miss it through all the wave of content coming up on social media. Uh, I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. So today's topic actually comes from me. 
Way back when we started the show, there was a big announcement for some important gaming award, the Spiel des Jahres, des, des Jahres, which at the time I had never heard of. So I sent this question into the bellhop. Doing a talk about this prize, the Spiel des Jahres, and its relevance to average players might be a worthy episode. There it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> When Sean sent me this, I, I totally agreed. Uh, this is a great topic. It's something definitely worth talking about. The thing is, he sent in this question in July 2018. And I know some of you were actually around back then. But at that point, we had recorded one and only one episode of our podcast. Uh, we were just starting up and didn't really have an audience at that point. I just kind of thought it'd be too early to waste such a good topic. Now, the Spiel des Jahres is such a big deal in board games, I thought it would be smart not to only talk about what uh, it might mean, but who might care, as well as the award itself. Yeah, we're already seeing mixed opinions on what the value of awards in our chat, which is what yep. I expect with mm -hmm. this kind of topic. Absolutely. But in general, what I did is I let the question sit, right? Uh, it literally was at the top of our question list. And to be honest, when I say I took the top question off the list when I'm talking about an episode, I'm slightly lying because this one was actually sitting on top of it. And I just let it sit there because, for one thing, I wanted it to be relevant to what's going on when we talked about it, which is why this past week, man, it was like it, within the last seven days, it was like every award either a winner or a nomination was announced. Like the, the Spiel des Jahres nominees came out. They, they were announced. The Golden Geek winners were announced. The Origin Award nominee list was released. Like this was all in a week. So it seems like it's award season. And what a better time to visit this topic. So we're going to start off with the biggest award in that industry. It's the one we already talked about. We already mentioned a couple of times and probably mispronounced horribly. The Spiel des Jahres or Jahres. This is the German Game of the Year Award. Actually, nowadays it's three awards, but it started as one award. Now, why should you care about what the Germans think about board games? Well, to be honest, they are responsible for most of what we call modern hobby board games. The entire concept of a Euro game is implying the game comes from Europe, and before the term Euro game was coined, they were called German games because these games literally came from Germany. It was g German game designers who brought us the first hobby board games. Settlers of Catan, which we just talked about in our last episode, is the biggest. But also games like Carcassonne, Bonanza, Power Grid, El, Gan El Grande. All of those Mayfair and Rio Grande favorites you remember over the years. Your Princes of Florence, Raw, like there's just tons of them. There, there is a ridiculous amount of these. And these are games that have been around since around the 95 to 2000 era. And these games are so good that people are still talking about them today. Um, I can't think of the last board game recommendation episode we did where I didn't mention one of these classic Euro games. Now, I'm not going to get into a full definition of what I mean by Euro game here. That's actually a question I've got on the back burner for another episode from a friend of mine, Mike Murphy. But just know that if it wasn't for the German board game revolution, hobby gaming wouldn't be what it is today. And because of that, the Essen Spiel or Spiel des Jahres is part of the sort of history of that same, uh, same growth of hobby board gaming. And that's where it comes from. Now, to this day, Essen Spiel is literally the biggest tabletop convention in the world. Yes, it is bigger than Gen Con. It is not technically bigger than PAX for numbers, but PAX is not is, is multiple things. There's board games at PAX. There's video games. You throw video games involved and you get millions of people. But this is a gaming convention bigger than Gen Con. But the biggest thing, though, is it is not much of a focus on role playing. Like compared to Gen Con, the amount of board games at Spiel is ridiculous. So there is nothing comparable in North America when you were looking at board games. Germany is still the hotbed of modern board gaming, and that's why the Spiel des Jahres is so well regarded. Now, one reason the Spiel des Jahres is so highly recognized is that unlike many other awards, it is not publicly voted. Mm -hmm. But a chosen few German language critics from German speaking countries are brought in to judge and jury the competition. 
And now this allows, arguably, obviously, some prof professionals to judge games fairly and evenly based on a set of criteria that has been established uh, and becomes much more fair than a simple publicity contest, which many of these will turn into. Now, from what I understand, I may be wrong on this, is aren't they also industry professionals? Like, they actually have experience in gaming? Uh, well, I think that's likely simply because in Germany... Uh, in order to do anything, you have to have a certain level of experience. Yeah, so I su suspect that in order to become a critic in Germany, you have to have done games. Right. Uh, to be Fair a light enough. to be a lighting designer in Germany, you actually have to have a degree in electrical engineering. Um, yes. it's it's that that kind of country, and and they do mm -hmm. things that way. So I wouldn't wouldn't surprise me, although I don't know for sure. Yeah, and there are game degrees in Germany that I know for sure. I've seen people's pedigree on that. Yep. So now. I'm, excuse me, I mentioned how Spiel de, the Spiel des Arts is now three awards. So it's now broken into three separate categories. There's still the, the Spiel des Arts, which is kind of weird because it's kind of changed. The actual Spiel, the, the base award is now much more of a family game award. The types of games that have been winning this probably in the last five, I'm not sure when the, the new category starts, five to ten years, uh, tend to be lighter, shorter games that are good in big groups or good with the entire family so kids can enjoy it too. Now, that upset a lot of people when it first happened because the older winners tended to be heavier Euro games, the, the gamer games, if you will. Now, those are part of the Kenner Spiel, the Yaris, which is the hobby game of the year. This is personally the award I care the most about because mo many of the Spiel awards I find a little too simple, though Games like Azul and Planet tend to be in there now, too. So that category has gotten better. Now, they also have the Kinderspiel, the Jars, which I think they actually allow in the U.S. under, like, instead of the Kinder Eggs. Now, this is another one I used to keep my eyes on a lot more, though winners and nominees tend to be for younger kids, like under 10. So as my kids get older, I pay a little less attention to the Kinderspiel. Now, not only do they have nominees and winners in each category, but they also have a list of notable games, which means that each year, sometimes up to 10 games will start sporting badges from Spiel. So you need to look carefully to know which game mm -hmm. actually won, which was nominated, and which was just recognized. Uh, because, you know, there's a different thing there, yet they will all have some form of Spiel des Jahres, uh, you know, logo on them, and they will be yeah. claiming, they will be claiming uh, you know, a pedigree from uh, Spiel des Jahres, despite yeah. maybe not winning. <laughs> yeah, oddly enough, they do. They allow producers, publishers to put that on there if they were even mentioned, right? Yeah. Though I got to say, anything that's even mentioned by the Spiel is probably worth at least giving a glance, take a Absolutely. look at it, right? Yep. That, that's, this is probably the most prestigious award. Yeah. Now, speaking of the most prestigious, there are a lot of other ones out there. Um, just going to list some of them off. Like the one I'm most involved in myself because I vote in it every time I go is the Origins Awards. I'll be going this year. And one of the things that Deanna and I have always done every time we go to Origins is vote in the Origins Awards. Now, part of this is they bribe you to do so because they give you a generic token for doing so. But hey, plus it's, it's kind of fun to do. Uh, another big one, this is the RPG one, the one that uh, hotly debated is the any awards i see it's already come up in chat on uh, the value of that particular award that one is handed out at gen con north america's biggest gaming convention there is the mensa award given out by the I, what is mensa considered is it a non-profit i don't know what mensa's a private club whatever mensa is i think people know what that is it's one of those you can apply if you're smart and prove that you're smarter than most people you get in um there's one the the golden ace award which i've heard people mention uh one of the ones the first experience i had with game awards it kind of showed the impact they can have was the games magazine which used to be my favorite magazine to buy it was a, a you pick it up at the newsstand and it was puzzles it was not just crossword puzzles but mazes and logic puzzles logic and puzzles. Yep. yeah i loved games magazine anytime we were going to travel somewhere i would buy a games magazine like deanna and i if we're taking the train up to london i buy a games magazine for us to do i don't even know if it's still around i think it is but back in the day we were going somewhere i think we we're going up to london i bought a magazine games magazine and, and it was the top 100 games of the year so we're flipping through and i'm like you know what we should buy 
whatever the number one game is, like whatever the game of the year is, it's probably going to be really good. Well, guess what that game was? Settlers of Catan. So sure enough, we get with wherever we went, went back to Windsor or whatever, I, wherever we had the game magazine for, got back to Windsor, went to the local RPG shop because I didn't think of it as a board game shop at the time. And we're like, hey, Ian, do you have this Settlers of Catan game? And he's like, yeah, yeah, it's over there on the counter. It's a, it's a really popular one. And we bought Settlers of Catan. And well, that's pretty much responsible for getting me back into hobby gaming. And in a bad way, I guess, getting me a bit away from role playing. But at that time, most of my role playing group had moved away. So this was a great way to get people back to the table. Now, in addition to um, official, whatever, industry awards, there's also a lot of podcasts have awards. I, I don't maybe once we're in our third year or something, we can actually be give out the, the Golden Ding Award or something. But like the, the biggest everyone knows of is the Dice Tower, right? Tom Vassell's empire of uh, uh, board game media. And they do the Dice Tower Awards. That's a hugely uh, watched one. That is one I noticed someone brought up in the chat. That's one they actually watch for. Uh, the Dice Tower Awards. The one I used to enjoy was the Heavy Cardboard Golden Elephant Awards. Though it looks like that one has died off and may or may not be coming back. Uh, there's the Squirrelies, which come from rolling dice and taking names, and there's a bunch more other ones. So basically anyone who's got a, a podcast that's been around for a while has probably got, uh, gotten around to doing giving out awards of some sort. Uh, and and thanks for the offer, Larry. But uh, I think we'll uh, wait a little uh, a little longer before we start handing out our own awards. Yeah. So someone else mentioned it. I didn't see that in the chat. But I'm, th <laughs> I'm thinking. I don't know. I, I we could probably we could probably do. I think we did a best. We could do best games of last year. The problem I would have giving out awards is most people want to know about the best games of 2018 or 20 whatever year it is or 2019. I'm not a new hotness kind of guy. Like we I can do the, the we can do 2011. I mean we're yeah, exactly. <laughs> we can we can nail those 20 set 2007 games really well. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like look at my best 20 games of all time on Twitch. You can scroll down and see them. Like those are not hot new modern games, right? Uh, it's just it's it's not my shtick. Other yeah. shows do that. We are not chasing the new hotness here. I still do play some modern games. We'll get to that later. Now, one of the other really big awards that I skipped over is uh, the Board Game Geek Awards. But out of all of them, and I think that the main ones that I see people talk about the most, these are the ones I tend to pay attention to the most, is the Spiel, of course. Like that, that one, that one you almost have to. Uh, there's the Golden Geek Awards from Board Game Geek. Those are good because uh, that's people who care, right? Like, People don't join Board Game Geek unless they care about the board game industry and the board game hobby. Um, the Golden Ace Award is one that seems like it's good, but I, to be honest, haven't heard much about it except people mention it. So that one's out there. But Origins matters to me just because I get to vote. I feel I have a bit of a say in it. Any's I don't care, but it's one of the few where I'll hear about new RPGs. So the only thing I do is I get the any awards, I look through them, and I go, oh, there's a game I never heard of, and I might Google it. Yeah. So for me, a lot of it depends on uh, what you'd like to get out of it when you're looking at uh, whether or not something matters or not. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you're just looking for what's new and what's out there, what people are talking about, some of these now have value. Uh, that doesn't mean they're going to be, I, I, a lot of them won't necessarily say they're great, but uh, they have value in at least being well talked about mm -hmm. uh, and rising up from the, you know, 8,000 games that came out last year. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it, right? The the two big things that I get out of gaming awards, whether they're popularity contests or vetted judges panels, doesn't even matter as much, is I'll learn about a game I never heard of. So I'll see a title that I've never heard of. Because many times you uh the, these shows like you'll be I'll be listening to a podcast, I'm like, whoa. I I I watch I listen to a lot of podcasts, I watch YouTube videos, I'm I kind of have my finger on the pulse for the board game industry. So when someone mentions a game I'd never heard of, that's rare, right? So I'm like, whoa, wait, what I have never heard of this. And I Google it or I go on Amazon or whatever. Right. So that's one thing. So the awards often will bring to my attention games I've never heard of. But more importantly, is it separates the wheat from the chaff, right? This was something that we talked about. A long time ago, and then Daniel Zayas was on our show, and we did an interview, and it's a fascinating interview. It was mostly about Kickstarter, but it he talked about, like, he blew us away. Like, I thought it was about 5,000 games come out a year. It's more like 8,000 games come out a year, and that's counting published games, not Kickstarters. And Kickstarters was like 18,000. Like, it was insane. There's just too many games for anyone to pay attention to all of them or for anyone to try them all. 
Like it just, you can't do it. There's just not enough time, let alone money and getting people together and coordinating like no one, no reviewer out there plays every game that comes out. So an award gives me, lets me narrow that down. It lets me focus. It lets me go instead of looking at 8,000 games, it'll bring it down to, well, depending on the list, it might bring it down to five. I should pay attention to, or it might bring it down to one, right? Game of the year. Hey, if you haven't looked at this yet, at least give it a glance to see if you might be interested. Yeah. So the problem comes in on how these games are in these contests and awards are adjudicated. What makes this game a winner and this game a loser? Uh. Yeah. So th that's it, right? Because not all awards are created equal. How the nominees are selected. How do they decide which games are they picking from? Because trust me, that's the other thing. None of these award companies or whatever uh, companies is the wrong term are looking at 8,000 games either, right? They, they get a short list from somewhere. Once you got a bunch of nominees, how are the winners determined? And plus, who are the people deciding this, right? So it's not even how the nominees are selected, but like what interest, what vested interest do the people have? who are, are doing this are they industry professional are they being paid are they getting copies of the games like all of that is gonna affect the validity of the wards like personally i want to know that it's an industry professional who's looking at the game and it's not just a popularity contest because i have seen way too many game publishers when it's around award time on twitter saying hey go vote for my game and all whatever dance for you give you this patron reward i'll send you a free pdf whatever right and that manipulates a vote and i hate that um what i don't mind is if there's a separate popular vote compared to a, a vetted vote i'm going to call it a vetted vote but you, that's what i mean by like an industry professional a panel of judges whatever you want to call it it's not just let's toss this thing out there and of course D, &D wins because everyone loves D, &D right now so if there's an rpg like i'm sure D, &D is going to sweep the ennies this year with the popularity of that game this year, there's almost no reason it shouldn't. But then other games get buried. But then we're talking about some of the negatives of awards there. Yeah. So, as we mentioned, the Spiel des Jahres is a professional award. Uh, imagine if American newspapers had game critics the way we have movie critics, and those people got to choose the best games that they had played and seen all year long. This is similar to how Spiel is picked, but among German-speaking nations, and as we discussed, that these critics are a little more uh, qualified than your average movie critic in America. Yeah. Uh, other juried awards are the um, Asdor, which is the Golden Ace, uh, which is actually um, the Cannes Festival. So Cannes has a a game festival as well as a movie festival uh and that's what the uh, the golden ace is now the origins award uh actually has two separate f uh, functions and and this kind of surprised mo when i when i was looking it up earlier yeah. um what you're voting for as a as the public when you go to origins is the fan favorite uh basically it is a popularity contest as a matter of fact but they actually have um the academy of um uh, a game design essentially, which votes after a juried panel picks the nominees. So it is a juried, uh, you know, a, picked by the peers of game designers, as it, as it were, for the origins. Yeah, um, origin origins is run by Gamma, which is a trade organization. Right. So it's members of that trade organization who have a vested interest in the gaming industry, right? So they're industry professionals in some way, mm -hmm. whether they're logistics people or they're game designers, that's left to be found. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's the Academy of Adventure Gaming Arts and Design is the actual um, uh, group in charge of that uh, particular contest. And uh, yeah, it was shocked. I actually thought when we were voting in the Origin Awards, we were voting for Game of the Year, but it makes sense, right? And, and I like that. I like that. People's choice, yes, it's a popularity award, but they're letting you know it's it's obviously a popularity award. So other awards are much less rigorous and mm -hmm. quickly deteriorate in popularity contests. Uh, awards like the Golden Geek from uh, Board Game Geek are popularity contests. Now, arguably, people who hang out in the Board Game mm -hmm. Geek forums are... To a certain degree, experts, uh, you know, they aren't, you know, they are going out and getting your mom to go and vote for your game. But it is open to, in theory, anyone because it's free to grab a grab a uh, a log on at Board Game Geek. Uh, 
And then other awards are even weirder, like the Mensa Award we yeah. mentioned. Uh, so this actually, you pay to attend a four-day weekend with 24-hour gaming for four days. You are required to play from beginning to finish 30 games, rate them, and submit ratings. So every time you play a game, you fill out a rating card and submit that, and then go on to your next game. The problem is, to uh, be displayed in that contest, you must the, the publishers must actually submit and pay a fee to have their game uh, in, the, uh, in the running. And then, if you have to play 30 games in four days, that really limits what sort of games you're going to be able to play and enjoy. Uh, and as I was mentioning earlier, you know, when you're into game hour 60 of that, you're not going to be playing an 18xx game. You're going to want to play Azul or Planet or Root or, you know, something a little lighter, not easy, not necessarily a filler game, but uh, something a little more fun and party-ish. Uh, and not surprisingly, that tends to be the sort of, uh, you know, part, not, not, par, not party necessarily, but... Uh, easier lightweight um games i think 2.75 was the highest game uh this year that that won uh sorry, for difficulty so Just don't don't lump root in with those roots a heavy war game it's a coin game right it has cute art but it is not a, a cute game it's a it's an hour to hour and a half teach that, Fair is, that is definitely not a light game Fair enough. but yeah I, I pretty much agree with everything sean just said uh board game geek like i said personally i do give that some credit because Again, you tend to join Board Game Geek if you're invested in the industry, right? You're you're a gamer Bronyard, right? You're on there because you care, and even more so if you're going to be on there to vote. But it can be manipulated. I've seen many companies send out emails when the Geek Awards are and like create a Board Game Geek account to vote for my game, and I'm like, oh come on, right? That's that's what I don't like about those is it can be manipulated. And someone's mom may join Board Game Geek just to vote for a game. And to be fair, I am a member of Board Game Geek, and I didn't know and didn't vote because I didn't know. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, well, that site has issues. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's another YouTube video we could probably get a lot of views on is how to use Board Game Geek. Yep. And we'll do a bunch of how-to how videos. Yep. Now, getting to Mensa. Mensa is weird. Like, to me, if I see Mensa Award, to me, it should be a thinking game, right? Like, that's the whole point of Mensa. It should be like a, a, a brain burner, right? And most of the games that win the Mensa Awards aren't at all. They're usually light family games. Uh, pu puzzles are popular. That makes sense. Puzzles and Mensa goes, goes together great. So I totally get that aspect. But when you're trying to get people to play 30 games, like, how many games can you fit in, right? Like, you're automatically gearing it that way. Yep. So I agree. Like, I... There are some fantastic Mensa games out there, Mensa award-winning games, and it is an award I pay attention to because it tends to be if the game wins, it's good. But you get an awful lot of toys, I find, nominated, right? The Think Fun, those logic puzzles and circuit puzzles and those kind of things are more what you see there. And you don't tend to see the big publishers, right? You don't see Asmodee games or Fantasy Flight games or even Stronghold games doesn't tend to be in the Mensa award. You see companies like Blue Orange Games and Think Fun and USAopoly. And uh, well, I have to say, uh, for this year's Mensa Awards, you actually love two out of the five. So, uh, so uh, two out of five, and and you have just literally bought th the third one. So, so you, so Gizmo, Gizmos, and Planet are both uh, yeah. big favorites for you, and they're up there. And you have just put down your money on Architects of the West Kingdom. So yeah, very true. But again, those are not heavy games, right? It's just no. it's it's the disconnect to me between Mensa and board game awards i just that's where i expect a root or an 18xx or uh libertalia not libertalia that's the wrong name the game with the wigs begins with an l i can't remember the name of it now lisboa that's what i was right. trying to think of or food chain magnet right like that's the kind of stuff i expect from mensa and it's not it yep uh, and then, yeah, Azul last year won. So, but oh, that, that won was, everything that last year. Won everything. <laughs> it, it did kind of win just about everything last year. Yeah, but it, it should have. I think it, it's well deserved. Yeah. Uh, so now that we've talked about why we should care about these awards or not, uh, let's yeah. take a look at some of this year's nominees and winners. 
Now, one thing I want to know really quick is that some of these have been awarded, some are still in nomination, and the other thing is this messes me up all the time, is every one of these has some weird rule about how to determine what was released in 2018. So some are the game has to have been published in 2018, some of them do from Essen to Essen, and others do must be released before Gen Con, and like one of the companies are already releasing their best of 2019, and it's May, like come on. So that just a caveat to that. I, I always have a problem with that. Like that's one of the things if we ever did awards, I'm gonna have difficulty deciding what what's our rule for like me, it's gonna be best games I played in 2018. Those are my awards, right? I put out my top 20 games of right now. There's my awards. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Uh, but I mean it's similar to the what happens with movies. I mean, you get you look at the Oscars and all those awards, they have, you know, this is the start date, this is the end date. It doesn't matter, you know, and, and it's rarely calendar year. It's, uh, you know, at least at least the games don't generally have ridiculous things like you must have been in a Los Angeles theater for four days for the <laughs> general pub public uh, in order to be eligible for award, you know. Um, well, most of them tend to be centered around Essen, right? That's, how, again, yeah. how big Ger Germany is still in the board game industry. A lot of it's from Essen to Essen is what a yeah. lot of the, that's what the Dice Tower uses. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I, we didn't mention it, but Dice Tower is actually a juried uh, award. It is a prof it is professionals in the yeah. industry uh, judging. So that that actually isn't one of the uh, uh, the popularity contest ones. Yeah, actually, it's, it's worth noting too. It's not even Tom's list. Yeah. Like the, he presents it, but like I think Tom gets one vote. But it's not even like the normal hosts aren't. Yeah, no, judge. no. It's it's a group of selected professionals, and I'm sure I, I don't know who and where they get their list from. But uh, it's not just our public. Uh, if any of you award people there are listening, I'll totally be on one of those panels. <laughs> I'd, uh, love to, I'd love to be a judge on some of these. I'd love to do the Mensa thing, to be honest. Yeah. So, we'll start off with the Spiel des Jahres Game of the Year. Uh, and we have, uh, as our uh, nominees, just one, uh, Ludovic Rowdy and Bruno Sauter, uh, Lama by Renier Knizia? Knizia. Rainier Nitzia. Uh, Rainier Nitzia. You know, Sean hasn't been around when. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, and Nitzia then it probably has more bar games published than any other game designer out there. And then Where Words by Ted Elsbach. Now, also noted, and this is where I got into the, uh, the I was mentioning earlier. They, these are the the you know we re we recommend looking at these games even though we didn't nominate them and they can't win. Uh, but Belrati. Uh, and it, it's interesting because uh, two of these games are listed in VGG as 2019 releases, despite yes. being a 2018. Uh, Belrati, Dizzle, which is one of the 2019s, uh, Imhotep the Duel, Who Did It, Reef, which is what I meant to say when I actually said Root. I meant to say Reef. Ah, uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what are you getting Root from? Yeah, no, I meant to say Reef. Uh, and Sherlock is the uh, the final note. Oh, that that's... <sighs> See, this is the, the other problem with the spiel is it's German, right? So I think Board Game Geek lists the North American releases. So those are probably coming out in 2019 here. Right. Uh, but out of those games, like Imhotep, I keep seeing on sale, but I don't think it's the duel. I think it's just Imhotep. And where words I know of, that it doesn't appeal to me. It's it's word based with social deduction, and anyone who listens knows what I think <laughs> of social deduction. Uh, but Reef has been up on my list since I heard about it. It's by the same guy that did Azul, and I just I can't find a copy. And when I can't find a copy, I don't have the money in the budget to try it. I need someone local to play, buy it so I can play it, because it looks fantastic. Now, interestingly, I just checked real quickly, and Werewords, Werewords is listed as a 2017, but they came out with a deluxe edition in 2018. Yeah, but I think that is just getting translated to German. Ah, uh, okay. Right? Like, that's that's right. why I kind of put that caveat at the beginning. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, well, as for what games qualify, it's it's kind of all over the board. Yep. Yeah, because uh, Where Words was produced by Ted Allspatch, who's Bezier Games, who is American. He's, I wouldn't call the game Meritrash, but the fact that he threw werewolves into a word game is a good showing the difference between Meritrash and Euro games right there. Yeah. One is all about theme and one is all about mechanics. And nowadays it's kind of pointless because, well, you have games like Where Words <laughs> where they mash the two. Right. So on to the children's game of the year. Again, this is a, this is a spiel. So Kinderspiel of the Yars, you got... Fabulantica from Marco 
Tubner. We shouldn't even bother saying the names. Yeah, we should probably stop butchering. We should probably stop uh, butchering these. So we're just names. gonna say the game names because we can pronounce most of those. I'm gonna say most because wait till you get to a couple down here. <laughs> uh, we have Go Gecko Go Valley of the Vikings. Those were the nominations. Then there's the also list. There's Bermhoff Bandy Concept Kids Animals Magic Maze Kids Monster Mash Monster Bandy Octopus and Vol Volwerkel. Oh, geez. I don't even know. Ver- Ver- Verwackelt. 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 And it's, it's Monster Match, not Mash, just in case uh, that didn't come out quite clearly. Now, uh, of those, the fact there's now a kid's version of Concept, I think, is awesome. I've yep. seen that here. So that's out over here. And I love Concept. My kids are at the point they can just play Concept. The rest of these, I have no clue. I've never heard of a single one of these games besides Concept Kids. Yeah, no, and and to me, I was looking earlier, and Monster Match looked similar to Monster Bandai, and you know, it's it, it, these are these are kids games, and I and I think they're probably solid kids games. I think if uh, if my kids weren't already sort of moving past that, I would definitely be looking at some of these. Uh, but I'm I, I'm really sort of feeling that these are aiming more towards you know the seven to eight you know six yes. to eight range that's um, eight or under but it's and because and because we as gamers tend to you know get our kids up into the the more advanced games quicker we're probably not the uh the key demographic for these particular games anymore yeah the other thing too is with the the kinder spiel these are the ones least likely to actually be translated and brought to north america of all the the spiel winners the kids games don't seem to all make it there's quite a few over the years that just never showed up that i was interested in Yep. Now, next we have the Kennerspiel des Jahres, which is the connoisseur or enthusiast game of the year, otherwise known as hobby game of the year. Uh, and now for this, we have a Feld for yeah. our uh, our host love, which is Carpe Diem. Uh, we have Detective, a modern crime board game, and not surprisingly, Wingspan. Uh, mm-hmm. And then noted are Architects of the West Kingdom, again, that's mentioned on two different lists now. Yep. Lowlands, Newton, and Paper Tales. Now, Newton's got to be the new printing, because Newton's been out for a while. There was a lot of hype, and they just released a new one. But the one I'm excited there is a new Feld. I'm actually behind on Felds. There's a few Felds. Uh, this I'm, I'm jumping ahead a bit, but I got invited to a dinner, from, or not dinner, but a special event at Origins on Wednesday by Queen Games. And I'm looking really forward to trying Merlin, which is Stefan Feld. And this Carpe Diem, from what I've heard, is fantastic. So it's another Feld I really want to try. Forum Trajanum is another one. I'm falling way behind in my Feld. So Carpe Diem is the big one on this list. Uh, basically, though, all of these I've heard of. Like every single one of these games people have been talking about, they're on podcasts. I literally just ordered a copy of Architects of the West Kingdom today. Um, so I'm looking forward to trying that one. And while Wingspan, everyone is talking about Wingspan. I'm actually not rushing out to buy it because I figure soon enough, like two out of five gamers in Windsor are going to own Wingspan. I'll get to play it whenever I want. Well, only if they actually have ever make enough copies for people to buy, which is... <laughs> well, they've been trickling through. Like the yeah. local stores have had copies in the last couple of weeks. So it, it's there's people around here that have it. They just may not be people I game with all the time. And so uh, from what I can tell, this is a new newton uh this is okay. not this is not there are a number of newtons listed oh, in uh in bgg and uh as i'm sort of looking through them none of them appear to be a re-release this is listed as a new version the only okay. the only versions of this game are 2018 and 2019 uh so this is this is something new um, okay so it's a new newton <laughs> yeah it's a new newton there we go all right. The other ones I want to talk about, because, uh, again, they're the ones I, I kind of respect the most, is uh, some of the Board Game Geek Awards. Now, one of the problems with the Board Game Geek Awards is there are just too many categories. Like, they, they have an award for everything, right? So this is not all yeah. of them. I just picked out some ones that, and in particular, interest me. Shadzar was commenting uh, that in some of these awards, you know, uh, if, a, if a deck builder wins the award, but you like tile laying games, it doesn't mean anything to you. Well, this is, you know, this, yeah, this these guys... Helped. These guys help because they just have a category for everything. Yeah, they do. <laughs> it's true. Uh, there's one of the, maybe it's the Any Awards does that with RPGs. Like, it is crazy, the number of categories. The problem I had with that was uh, overlap, right? So you have a deck builder and you have the best card game. Well, if the same game wins both, are they split up? But anyway, yeah. uh, we're just going to highlight some. Of course, the biggest is the game of the year. Uh, these are actual winners. So the, this went through. This is done. Voting is over. I actually voted. So I actually played quite a few of the games on the board game geek list, which is surprising because I look at the Spiel de Jar Spiel de Jar's list and I'm lost. <laughs> uh, so game of the year was Root. 
I still haven't played it. Runner up was Brass Birmingham. I talked about it last week. Love it. Uh, and Architects of the West Kingdom, as I said, bought it today. So I haven't gotten to try Root, though. I got to get that played at some point. I have friends that have it that want me to try. I just haven't had time to sit down. Yep. So for two-player game, uh, oddly, I've actually played two out of the three of yep. them. Uh, the winner is Keyforge, Call of the Archon. Yep. And now I think we both had a discussion earlier offline that they're you know they're coming out with a new they're coming out with a new expansion and this will make or break the game in my opinion uh if they cannot pick it up and and get a strong demand going with the the new expansion this was a flash in the pan and will go the way of the dodo yeah that's that's what i'm expecting but we'll see we'll see I've also heard rumors that the new decks are significantly different enough from the old ones that, well, yes, you can play against them. There's not going to be any value in playing the original decks. I don't know how true that is. We'll see. I'll admit my personal fire for that game is pretty much already died off. Yep. Uh, The runner-ups are Dulasaur Island, which uh, you missed out on. Yep. (laughs) Yeah, I should have, I I guess. I, I don't know. I don't play a lot of two-player games. Like, the fact my wife plays games, we prefer to play with three, four people. I, I We play some two-player games or some we love, right? Like Patchwork, The Duke, War Chess now. Uh, but we don't play a ton of them, right? We have this small group we like. So when the Pandasaurus Kickstarter came out for Dinosaur Island, the new printing, the totally liquid version, I went all in for the upgraded components and for the expansion, but I totally skipped over the two-player thing. Seeing it nominated for... Uh, Golden Geek is making me think maybe I should have gave it a chance. And I, and I do see a lot of buzz about it just in general outside of yeah. the, the award talk. And then our next runner-up is War Chest, which we've yeah. all, all played now, and uh, we, we've loved it, so yeah. not it's a big shock there. Uh, I'm, I'm actually kind of uh, amused because I think last in, in the long term, I think War, Ch- War Chest will absolutely outlast oh, yeah. Keyforge. Uh, no one will be talking about Keyforge in a few years, even if this expansion does do it. Whereas I think we will continue talking about War Chest for a while. Yeah, I don't think Keyforge is going to be the next Magic the Gathering. There's no. a chance. There's there's always a chance, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think uh, I think it's it's a one and done. But we'll yeah. see. So up next is card games. The rather controversial winner, based on most people out in the world, is the Mind. Now, the runner-up, and here's what I talked about earlier with overlapping, is Keyforge, Call of the Archons, with the second runner-up being Thunderstone Quest. Now, I really like Thunderstone Advance. Uh, I've got the Numenera edition. It was great. And I don't know. I just, Thunderstone Quest just, I, it was one of those, they put out a new edition of a game I already spent a lot of money on, and I sometimes just get turned off by that. I'm like, I have thunderstorm advance and i don't care if quest is better but the fact is getting nominated for awards does mean i should probably give it a chance yeah although i have to say it's, it's only got the golden geek award it doesn't show anything else listing on there yeah so. we haven't really seen it because we were we were looking at a lot of different reward shows today earlier where we were looking at this episode yeah uh but it's showing an 8.1 on board game geek so at least within there That's you know hot. Yeah, with with uh with over a thousand, with almost well, over fifteen hundred ratings, wow. showing an eight point one is yeah. is a pretty solid. Uh, well, to be honest, Thunderstone Advance was great. So if they improved on it at all, it's probably really good. It just right. it's the throw out my box full of cards with three different expansions in it. I know you don't have to throw them out. You can still play the old version, but sometimes yep. things get Jones theoried. Yep. Uh, so uh, next up we have cooperative games. And again, once more overlap, yeah. the winner is the mind. Uh, with a runner, say that. Yeah. with a runner up of Chronicles of Crime and Detective, a modern crime board game. Which again, uh, that's another one that's, that's sort of popping up uh, yeah, and getting talked about quite a lot. A lot of people went nuts for Detective. Detective uses an app, and you have. One group of the people are like trying to solve the crime where the other guy has the app and is literally moving your your digital device around looking for clues. So it, it's it's did some really cool looking stuff. Uh, the big thing, though, is the mind, right? There are a lot of people upset that the mind is winning so many awards. Personally, I think it's well deserved. I played the mind. I thought it was really neat. It's it's a brilliantly designed game for something so simple, a game I could probably make myself right just writing numbers one to a hundred on a deck of cards right uh but it's good like we played it we had fun and the fact people seem to think it's an activity i'm like i don't know uh, there's a game there you can win you can lose it's not Candyland. it's not predetermined 
There yeah, are I, options. You make choices. And I think I, it's interesting. I, I, I've seen a lot of sort of pushback on any time anyone mentions the the mind as a, uh, a top game. Um, and I'm not even sure if it's activity so much as it's just too basic. It's more almost party game compared to yeah. something. I mean, people want the, the thinkers and, and it, you know, it's, it may be a fun game, but it's not a real thinker. Right? It's a pretty lightweight uh, weight game. And I think that's yeah. driving some people crazy. But, you know, tough. <laughs> yeah. If people exactly. are having fun playing it, it's it's a good game. And, uh, as uh, Chris Nizak is like to say, well, go make your own ward system. <laughs> you don't have to put the mind on it. Yep. So I kept this one in here um, because there's a game I wanted to talk about and mention that I think should have won, uh, except I haven't played the first one, so I can't really say that straight up. But I didn't hate, like the original game, so I guess I wouldn't like the expansion. So this is the winner of the Golden Geek expansion of the year. Uh, this was Scythe Rise of Fenry. Now, I got to admit, I'm not a Scythe fan, and I'm probably going to actually get some booze for this. This is probably one of my most controversial um, board game opinions, except for the whole I don't like social deduction. But that cuts out a whole genre. I should like Scythe. I just eh, haven't had fun playing it. This expansion adds campaign play, which does make it sound a little cooler, but I dislike scythe enough i'm not really willing to try but the runner-up terraforming mars prelude anytime i say never pull the expansion out i'm gonna play it with the game every time that should be a winner to me like terraforming mars won a million awards last year i'm surprised this expansion's not up there uh last is the last runner-up is the expansion for root that adds the river folk now it's interesting you know i i know nothing about scythe i know it's got a huge buzz i know it's got a huge following but just looking through bgg it is rated staggeringly high across every single one of its versions. The only version that dips below eight is my little scythe. So I've heard people tell me that's better. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the, uh, the Rise of Fenris is with over 2,000 ratings and 8.9. Wow, that's I mean, a nine. Yeah, uh, that's. I, I don't know. Maybe I played with the wrong people. I I don't know. I did yeah. not enjoy my play of Scythe. Because I, I mean, I gotta say, something that's hitting that high with two thousand ratings on yeah. Board Game Geek is is a uh, a kind of staggering that achievement, is. really. Um, yeah, it, yeah, Gloomhaven's still number one. Yep. Uh, family game. Gloomhaven rated at. Uh, I, you know I, I know I'm getting off topic. Yeah, we can no, I, we can, we'll look at that after. Um, uh, interesting llama, which is in BGG, is actually top of the hotness right now, uh, which is in the spiel. Yeah, that was, uh, well, <laughs> everything that's in the spiel is going to be on the hotness now, right? It was just yeah, announced yeah. yesterday. So, yeah. uh, and so for family games, the winner is the Quacks of Quidlinburg. Yep, that's it. All right. Uh, the runner-ups are Welcome to and da, 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 The Mind. Yes. Like I said, there's, people are seething. It's on so many <laughs> lists. I got to say, Quedlinburg, I keep hearing good things. Um, welcome to as well. Though I still don't get why anyone calls it Welcome to because the box says Welcome to Your Perfect Home. Um, what started with cutting off the full title of that game? I don't get it. All I know is it's a roll and write where you build something. I don't know. Your house, I guess. <laughs> really popular. Quedlinburg, though, of all of those, has caught my eye. Looks really cool. Right. All right, the last one we're going to talk about, because we've been talking about awards for a lot, and you've already previously got our opinions, is the strategy game. So this is the board game geek version of the Kenner Spiel, right? The the gamer's game, or what I forget what they called it that sounded a little better than gamer's game. Above. Oh, well, whatever the, the, the Spiel people called it. So the winner here is Brass Birmingham, followed up by Root and then Teotihuacan, City of the Gods. I have played Brass Birmingham. I think it was last week. I talked all about it. Really good version of the Stefan Feld. Not Stefan Feld. Whoa, I almost messed that up. Martin Wallace Classic. Uh, Root, I got to play it. Teotihuacan, I'm scheduled to play this Saturday, assuming my mother-in-law will take the kids. So please, Brenda, take the kids so I can go play Teotihuacan. Uh, if that doesn't happen, I'm sure I'll get it played at some point. Uh, and just to uh, to touch back, so it's actually uh, Gloomhaven is an eight point nine, yeah. but it has twenty five thousand ratings. Okay, so it's the number compared of, to say, compared to two thousand ratings. Nine. No, it's it's an eight point nine as well, but it has ten times as many votes. votes. All right, just um, to summarize then, right? This is basically what we had to say about it. So awards or not, personally, I think they are extremely valuable. 
not necessarily to tell you what to buy, but to at least tell you what to look at. The main thing being there's just too many games coming out. I've heard many people talking about the bubble, and I'm starting to believe it. Like You can't just put out 10,000 games a year. Like no one, no one, There aren't enough gamers out there to play all of them. And when you're presented with 10,000 options, how are you supposed to pick? And that is where I think awards are important. Just there's things to watch out for. You may want to pay attention to who's voting, what they're voting for, what their criteria is, and so on. We mentioned some of the best awards out there, the ones to pay attention to, which to us are the ones that have a panel of judges, right? They have industry professionals making these decisions. So we're looking at the Origin Awards. We're looking at the Cons Game Festival Awards. Uh, I forget the name, the Arc Door or whatever it is, Golden As- something. As Door. Asdor, there you go. Golden Ace. Uh, and of course, the famous Spiel de Diaris, right? Um, I'd say take a look at these, right? Look for the labels on the boxes. Back when we picked up Games Magazine, whatever issue it was, and it said the top 100 games of all time, and I bought the number one game, it was Settlers of Catan. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here doing this podcast. I'd probably still be playing Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay or sitting there reading Knights of the Dinner Table, wishing I could get an RPG group back together again. It's, they, they can influence people. They can make a difference. And if you're a publisher, sure, you love awards, right? Any game that wins awards is going to sell better. But as someone buying, you're going to use them as a, uh, a funnel, something to narrow down your focus to tell you what games to look at. The other thing, too, is it'll get you to know designers and publishers. So once they win awards, you look and go, oh, I really like the Stefan Feld game that won an award. Now I might look at other Stefan Feld games. Uh, uh, anything uh, to add to that? Well, uh, we had Major Kayla pointing out, you know, if she sees the stickers on a box, she'll look more closely than she would have uh, as she's browsing a, ch- a shelf. But it's not a yeah. quick, it's not a jump to buy. It just means this is worth looking into and seeing. Exactly. You know what the reviews say and 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 what says um a lot of people you know shadzar is pointing out that uh some people just blindly you know go through and and, and will buy games lists but then those same people will also blindly go through and see if, if it's got a kickstarter sticker on it they just like to see some mark of representation on there and uh you know yeah I get anything, it anything that makes it different <laughs> A Kickstarter sticker is not going to sell a game to me. There are way, way too many bad games produced on Kickstarter. And they still, to this day, outweigh the number of good games coming out of Kickstarter. We we do need to redo the Kickstarter episode at some point. We, we've been tasked with doing that. Yes, yes. The Kickstarter needs to be re, re-talked about. And, uh, in, 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 well, so does BGG, because technically we did that too, and, and we don't... Uh, yes. we, oh yeah, we didn't release that one? No, no, we buried that one. Oh, okay. I, uh, I mean, we, it's I it, it's around that. somewhere, but no, I don't think we ever we, we never released it. That was one of our extras. All right. I thought we actually put that one out while we were at uh, QCC or something. Mm, no, no, I never wrote no. no. All right. So, yeah, overall, uh, based on what I saw through the lob- lobby, um, there's people who, again, we, we, had a, we had kind of a split both ways. We had people who were vehemently opposed, not opposed to all rewards, but awards but thought them thought of them as popularity contests ways to which, promote which games, many of them which many of them really advertising, are advertising right it, yep. it's a form of advertising yep. which also is a way to filter what you're looking at i i think the big take home is is it the, if a game won an award it deserves a, a second chance right a, a look a glance it, it deserves not just getting passed over take a look at it and go hey this won an award i wonder why and then maybe put it down maybe give it a try yep so that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read about gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see topics like this answered in blog form. And if you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, and share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. We want to grow. We're still small. We want to be bigger. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous, blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. 
You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and click on, on the spot in the sidebar. Now, one of the awards we just talked about was the Origins Awards. And these, at least part of them, the popular vote are the People's Choice part is voted on by attendees of the Origins Games Fair that's hitting next month. Now, this is a con that I personally will be attending, and you bet I'll be getting my votes in. Now, I would love to say I'd be attending the award ceremony, but like this seems crazy to me. They want $40 a head to attend and like there's no meal or drinks at this like i i just can't see spending forty dollars to go sit and watch people win origins awards yeah i'm they, a little blown away by that one you'd think you'd think media would have a little better access to that yeah there's that too yeah so far uh deanna and i were talking about that so yes i am actually attending origins as media for the first time so thank you origins for welcoming me in that capacity i hope i do a good enough job that you'll have me back previous or future years having me back previous years i'm not time traveling <laughs> to previous origins i told you we're not about the, the future games uh, the new hotness it's because we actually go back to when the games were actually hot we could totally do that we we should we could totally retheme the show and then act like these games just came out yeah and they're the new hotness and we could look at their board game geek rating from back then anyway whoa i'm way off all right so origins uh if you want to meet up this is unlike previous years where I'm like, hey, come hang out with me. No, people are actually like booking me. I'm, my schedule is starting to actually fill up. So that's that's one of the advantages of going to media is I'm actually getting emails from from various game companies. Like um, I'm going to a Queen Games preview event Wednesday night now, which is pretty cool. because That's the day before the con starts. And that's so I can actually get in some of the gaming without having to do it in the dealer hall. Right. So that's pretty cool. So watch my social media for some things on the, the Wednesday night of origins. I'll be sharing some of the hot new stuff from queen games. Uh, but if you want to meet up, give me an email, hit me up on social media. Um, Thursday nights already booked. I am looking for stuff to do Friday, Saturday nights, uh, as well as during the day. So. Now I'm going to keep this week's Gloomhaven update pretty short and sweet. Uh, yes, we played. Yes, we streamed it. Yes, people joined in the chat room on Twitch. We had a good time. Uh, our Mind Thief is still out of commission, so this was another night of random dungeons. Uh, similar to last week, Tori and Kat, otherwise known as Kator, some reason when we play that game, our two orchids, uh, the Doom Stalker, we got the right name, and the Spell Weaver, uh, played while I did the whole Dungeon Master thing again and controlled the bad guys. What I thought was most interesting about this week compared to last week is that last week they just, it was a cakewalk. Like they just blew through it, especially the first dungeon. Like they went through six rooms in record time. This past Friday was way more of a slog and ended up in two defeats. So one of the things I did, because especially I think it's probably because I wasn't playing, so it was running through my head as I was DMing the game, uh, was at the end of the stream, I actually did a short interview with Tori and Kat and kind of asked them some questions, right? Like, what what do you think you did right in that campaign? What How do you think you failed? Where did you think you failed? What cards would you have taken different? Now, I think this is something I'm going to work into more on the stream. Like, to me, this is more value-added content. Have some actual strategy and tactics comments after the game's done. Now, I thought this was a great touch and added a bit more personality to the game. So it's not just anyone playing through the game with those characters doing a random dungeon. You watch them play and, and go away. It adds a little bit more about the thought process and uh, interest to the uh, event. Now, this Friday coming up it is um, was up in the air, but I got a text actually right when we started it. We are on for Gloomhaven. So there was a chance we had something else planned, but it should be another Gloomhaven game uh if by chance it does get canceled though sean and i have made backup plans and because of how popular that gloomhaven faq is like seriously it's still blowing up keeps getting more views uh we're going to try another one and this time we are going to read through terraforming mars so it's probably not going to happen this friday but it is our backup plan if plans to play gloomhaven fall through <laughs> Sounds good to me. So join us Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and see if Tori and Kat have learned from their mistakes or join Mo and I as we look at how you've been playing Terraforming Mars wrong. <laughs> uh, and I just want to say that it was probably 2006 that uh, Settlers of Catan became the top of the uh, game Buyer's Guide to Games for Games Magazine's 100 okay. uh, publication. So that 
So, Sounds about right. So it would have been no, about. That can't be right because no? I would have been the year before Gwen was born, and we would have been in the house. Oh, we were okay. playing Catan when Deanna was in an apartment, and my parents were doing the snowboard snowbird thing and going down to Texas. And every Saturday, <laughs> we would house it and watch their house and water all the plants and clean the house and whatever. And we would have Sean Skolak over and Dee's sister over, and we would play Catan till about four in the morning while raiding craft beer. That was definitely while Deanna was still in the apartment. So. <laughs> It must have hit the, the, the number one game before that. It's weird, because it's actually never won their Games 100. That doesn't... I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know where those magazines are. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Or maybe I'm totally wrong, and it was just in a list of games, top 100 games, and we didn't buy the number <laughs> one. All right. Uh. So up next, I want to talk about an RPG a month review. Uh, this actually should have been last week, but I totally forgot to toss it in the show notes, but better late than never. So we've mentioned RPG a month before on the show, and this is one of those yearly gaming challenges. The goal of this particular challenge is to read one RPG item a month with the goal of getting some of those used books off your shelf or off your hard drive that are gathering dust. So, so far this year, I've actually kept up on the challenge. So today I'm going to talk about the book I read in April 2019. Though in this case, I kind of bent the rules because the game I read was not getting an unused book off my personal shelves. Uh, it seems people dug my Shadows of the Demon Lord review, which is awesome. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback on that and multiple comments. And one of those was from a company called the Merciless Merchants. And they were really excited about this new OSR RPG module. That's old school revival, old school revolution, whatever definition of the OSR you want to go with. But basically it's a um, old style of play, right? Going back to seventies and eighties D and D style. Now I love RPGs, but I'm as much a role player as I am a board gamer and I've been playing RPGs long enough that I remember the old school games when they were the new school games, right? I they, they weren't old school to me, but I'm just not really an OSR gamer now. Like, while I dug and have lots of fond memories of those days, I pretty much moved on to more modern games now to this. So initially, I said no. After all, it's pretty hard to justify, you know, giving out your opinion on a game you've never played and are unlikely to ever play in any way. <laughs> yeah, very true. So I declined, and then they came back with another offer. So like, all right, we don't want you to review our new product. Uh, we don't even need a review at all. What I want you to do is we're going to send you a different module. It's something older in their collection. Now, I've since learned it was the first published module they did. And they wanted some pretty specific feedback. Now, I'm not going to get into the conversation went back and forth between them. Um and what feedback they wanted, but they wanted something rather unique, right? Something specific based on my tons of play. I'd say I play lots of games and review stuff. They're like, you must have played thousands of hours of RPGs, and I probably have. I'm like, all right, I'll give you that. And they're like, you don't even have to do a review. And then they hit me up with one more selling point, and this is the one that worked. They're like, I don't know if you noticed, but this is written for, for Gold and Glory is the name of the system. And I'm like, yeah, so for Gold and Glory, it's Osric, it's BX, it's Black Box, it's White Star, whatever, right? And they're like, no, no, for Gold and Glory is an advanced Dungeons and Dragons second edition retro clown. Wow. Uh, gotta say, like, Bullseye, because of all the old school games, except maybe Warhammer, they managed to have modules for the one system I played the heck out of back in the day. Like, I ran a campaign that spanned 10 real life years that started in high school, went all the way through when I was in university and passed. Yeah. And now this is a whole different ball game. While it may have been a while, all of us had a lot of XP yes. in Second Ed. And I even kept playing under different DMs while I went off to school in our dorms. Uh, it was just the game. Yeah, that is what we played. This was my this was one of the things I hated about D&D &D was everyone always knew D&D, &D, right? I'd show up, like, let's play Cyberpunk, and you got six players, and everyone say, oh, I don't like Cyberpunk. The one game everyone would agree on was D&D, &D, and that's, so we played it a lot, because you got six random gamers together, it was the, it was the common denominator, right? I'm not even gonna say lowest, it was just the common denominator that everyone knew, so we're like, fine, we'll play D&D. &D. And I did that for like 10 years, because it kept meeting new gamers. Through multiple worlds, I had an ongoing campaign, it was crazy, I played a lot. So they twisted me arm, my arm in, in a good way. So I provided the feedback they wanted. But I'm like, I read the book. 
it was April when I read the book. I need something for RPG a month, so why not write up the review? So here's where you get to the hard part here on the podcast. Uh, what do I talk about about this module without spoiling it, right? It's a module. How do I review a module without giving it away? There's not much I can say. So if you want a DM, an AD&D module, or you're curious about a D&D module and you don't plan on playing an AD&D second ed module, sorry, for gold or and glory module, go over to the blog, click on reviews. You'll find it there. It's there. I broke it down chapter by chapter. I give my thoughts on each section and the overall adventure, uh, but it pretty much spoils the entire thing. I don't want to do that here. I don't. I don't want you guys to opt out and turn off the episode and not hear the rest of what we have to say because you don't want to hear about this module. What I will say here is a very brief overview. This is the kind of stuff you can almost read on the back of the, the box, right? Box is not a box. It's a module. Uh, it's an adventure for four to seven characters, levels two to four. Again, it's for four gold and glory, which is 100% compatible with AD&D second edition, including skills and powers, whatever you want to mix in there. Uh, it's set in a generic fantasy setting, so don't throw it into your Dark Sun campaign, but it should work anywhere else where there's a forest. Uh, in it, the characters arrive at somewhere called the Willowmere Way, Way House, which is a small hamlet, and a bunch of odd things are going on. Merchants are waking up in the middle of the woods with some of their gear replaced with trinkets, marbles, stones, and berries. Uh, they have vague memories of something coming out of the woods at them, but that's it. Guards sent to investigate tell similar stories. They return to town the next day confused and dazed, with their swords replaced with breadsticks and gold swapped for jacks. What could be behind all these strange circumstances? Well, I proofread the review, so I know, but I'll keep quiet. <laughs> Overall, it's a, it's a whimsical adventure with a very solid and engaging plot twist, one that I, I was really impressed by. It's well written, even though an editor could have given it a few more passes. Uh, my major complaint, though, with the entire thing was one of artwork not matching the text of the book. Now, this not only includes like encounter artwork or they describe an NPC and there'd be a picture there that looked nothing like what they just described. But what hurt was that the actual maps didn't match the text. Now, I get it. This is an indie RPG. And from what I understand, the first one this company ever put out. So they went with stock art, right? Art is expensive. But I just had a hard time getting over the fact things didn't sync up, especially the maps. Because there was a map with these fantastic, or a dungeon, we'll say, with these fantastic room descriptions. And then you just had these blobs around a tree root. That was the actual like supposed map you were supposed to use. Like if I was going to use that, unless I'm running my game 100% theater of the mind and just improvising as I describe rooms, I'm going to have to do some work to finish the map. Yeah, no, it's breakout panels this year that we had. There was an artist panel uh, and it specifically talked about using multiple artists for your source and how you can do that. And one of the things you have to do is really manage it. And get mm -hmm. on it. You can't just send out a brief to a bunch of different artists and say, I need some stuff, and then shove it in your book afterwards. Uh, it needs some handling. Even if even if you are sending it out to Fiverr and getting cheap art done, mm -hmm. uh, it has to be managed. And and it clearly sounds like they, they were lacking in artistic management uh, within the project. In this case, I don't even think they did that. I think they got stock art. Like, I literally think they went and found copyright free. Like, I don't think they stole any art. I'm not trying to imply that. But, it, like, you can get tons of stock art on Drive Through RPG and sites like that. There's Deviant Art, there's yep. Elfwood. It's out there. And yep. I think that's what they did. And they went, okay, we need a picture of a tired adventurer. So, so one of the scenes in the thing, this isn't even going to spoil much because I already eventually mentioned it. You're going to come across a guy laying asleep in the woods. You wake him up, he's totally confused, his gear is missing, and he's holding a breadstick in his hand. The picture on that page is a guy with a pike leaning against a tree. And I'm like, ah, like what they Google tired warrior, and that's the image they chose. Like, it just, it bugged me. It probably more than it should have, but for some reason it just, and another one was they showed a top-down map, and the inn you're staying at has ramparts and crenellations on the top. And then you open the map page, and it's a building with a peaked roof. Like it just little things, but it just, it bugged me. So despite this, and maybe it's just me, there's a lot to like in this module. I, I really did dig the story being told. There's, there's some great whimsy here. It's, it's, it's a really neat module. It sounds like a lot of fun to play and it sounds like it'd be fun to run. 
So if you happen to still be playing a D&D second edition, I know you're out there, or if you're playing for Golden Glory, I do recommend checking out this module. For a way more detailed look at this module, be sure to head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. Now, I've only got one game this week, and it's one of the BattleCon games. And I've got Jaipur, a fast-paced card trading game of set collection and redemption with jewels, gold, silver, spices, and camels. Uh, now, Eric invited me into a game of it over on Board Game Arena, and after accepting it, I quickly perused the rules to figure out what I'd said yes to. <laughs> Uh, it's not exactly complex, but it does involve some card counting and tracking, which has never been my strong suit. Uh, so Eric's been kicking my butt pretty solidly so far, but I have managed to eke out a couple of wins. Uh, so I'm hopeful that I can finally start being some de decent competition to him. Uh, it's a quick enough game that we've actually been playing real time during the day while we're both working, uh, and just, you know, looking over, I've got it open on another monitor and we just sort of click through. Um, I've got, I'm not even, I'm not even recording plays of it because I'm playing like three or four times a day. Wow. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a great little game for that. Yeah, that's a well-regarded two-player game that I've never actually tried. So we've talked quite a bit about learning games on Board Game Arena. How is this one? Uh, you know what? There's nothing really to it. Uh, it's 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 just cards. Um, so uh, the only thing is I, there's one portion of the scoring that I'm still not 100% sure how it scores i believe it's actually mm -hmm. i believe it actually is random uh which is why it doesn't make any sense to me okay um but uh if you when you when you uh when you uh sell a set of cards um there are bonuses for a certain for selling certain sizes of sets um and they appear to be random um, Odd. and and i think they actually are i think it's that you preset coins and, and you just pull the top coin off when you sell a set of that number mm. but uh i haven't really figured that one out yet because it hasn't made enough of a difference in uh, things but yeah. uh, it's really interesting because actually managing camels is actually the largest part of the game you don't want camels but they're very useful at the same time mm. so yeah it's definitely a well-regarded game it's, yeah. it's one of the ones that's on my list that again if i played more two-player games yeah so for me it was slow uh that didn't get a lot of gaming there was no event at the local game store and Except for Gloomhaven on Friday, the only other game I played was BattleCon War of Indines. Now, with Deanna recovering, I've been trying to find some two-player games to play with her that fit on her sister's ridiculously small dining room table. I think she spent way too much time at the second cup as a kid because there's just way too small a table. Because I brought Terraforming Mars over that one time and it worked, but like we had two TV trays and... I don't know, it was a hi-fi or a vanity or something. We had to put some other cubes on, like we spread. So uh, we, I needed to find something smaller. Now, the other reason I grabbed this game is that it's been on the pile of shame for quite some time. So it was one I wanted to get off. So now before I go into my thoughts, I need to make sure people know exactly what game I'm talking about because man, there are a lot of BattleCon games, which is confusing in itself. But not only that, when I checked Board Game Geek when I was writing about this, there are multiple versions of the same game. This one in particular, there are at least three. So the one I am talking about is War of Indines, and I am talking about what people are calling the remastered edition of War of Indines. Now, I guess this was the second printing of the game because the original version is called the classic version. And the big difference is that each of the fighters in this game's art was done by a different artist, whereas the one I own was released after some expansions were done and they hired the artists that did the expansions to go back and redesign the characters. So the overall uh, battle con system all looked the same, which I guess makes sense. Plus, they did some component upgrades and some tweaks to individual characters. Now, there's another version out there too called the extended edition which has new costumes and extra game systems whatever that means so the important part is to know i am talking about the second remastered edition of war of indines which i honestly don't know how much that matters i don't know what the differences are and i don't know 
what it matters, but maybe what I'm talking about has been completely fixed and changed the extended edition, or maybe it's the same game with new art and stuff. I don't know. Well, it's good to see they haven't tried confusing matters with their releases. I'm looking <laughs> through right now some of the board game geek lists of, yeah. of not only BattleCon, but you can actually look up Ward, World of Indines, yeah. which is its own sort of thread of my lord. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's big. It is a big thing. So I am specifically talking about BattleCon War of Indines. I have no idea about any of the other games. I'm, I have to assume that they're similar based on some of the stuff I read, but I don't know. So that game, I'm talking about that one, whether I like it or not, only applies to this particular version. So here's what BattleCon is, which I think is really cool and really unique. This is a card game attempting to recreate the feel of a 2D fighting video game. So your Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, Soul Blade, Tekken, uh, not even Tekken, because you can go 3D in Tekken. So not Tekken, technically the, the 2D ones only. So again, Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat being the most, the big ones. Samurai Swords, I don't even know. There were so many of these uh, when I was growing up, and I was a big fan. Street Fighter 2 especially, I spent a fortune on. Now, there are multiple games in the series, and from what I understand, you can mix and match them freely. And the big difference from all these different Indine sets is that which fighters you get. So War of Indines, again, that's the one I have, has a ridiculous 18 different fighters, um, which I thought was a crazy amount for a game like this. Like, I, I expect way less when I buy a game for factions. 18. That's a lot of combinations. What is it, 18 to the power of 18 or something? For I, Fermentation combinations was a long time ago. It's a lot of different combos to be able to do. Now, those 18 fighters are split over difficulty levels, and when, what I thought was neat here is the difficulty is based not on how tough the characters are. They're all supposedly well-balanced, but on rather how difficult they are to play. So again, that's similar to Sentinels of the Multiverse, right? Where supposedly all the characters work, but a level three difficulty just means you're going to have to read your cards different or figure out card combos or have more tokens in play. So it's sort of a Marvel versus Capcom, but with original characters instead of licensed properties. Yeah, basically, or at least at any of them. There's so many of those 2D fighters out there, right? So just like the video games, each standard game is a two out of three match between two characters. Each match lasts up to 15 rounds. So there's a countdown timer, again, just like the, the video games, or until one of the two fighters is knocked out. That's done by reducing their health from 20 down to zero. Now, each player has the exact same set of standard attack cards and one unique attack card for their character. On the other side, they have a set of stances or styles. They're called styles. And those are 100% unique for each character. And different characters have different number of these styles. Each round, which is called the beat, so each of the 15 rounds, you're going to pick one style and one attack. So you could have like a sweeping advance or a powerful advance. And you combo the cards and you put them face down so no one sees what you do. And then you're going to flip them. And then... You simultaneously reveal them, and then the cards have three stats on them. There's range, power, and priority. The character whose priority higher is not, or is whose priority is higher acts first. And they're just you add up both cards, right? So you add up your left card to your right card, your your strategy with your your tactic, basically. Uh, whoever has highest priority is going to go first. If they're in range, they're going to do damage equal to their power. The interesting part here is they have the whole combo block system from fighting games with something called stun. If you hit your opponent first, they're stunned and they don't get to retaliate unless they generate something called stun block. Yeah, it's funky terms. Uh, if they're not stunned, the opponent then attacks back. Now, of course, that's the super basic, if all the cards had no special text on them, every card has some rule, right? Think Magic the Gathering here. Think Keyforge. Every card does something. And there are a ridiculous number of triggers and effects on these cards. And this is the meat of the game, is trying to figure out what combo of cards to play and anticipate where your opponent's going to play, and then using the game's somewhat complicated timing system to your advantage. Now, what I did like is that everything was open. And the cards were very clear using um, geometric symbols to tell what you have. So you always know what cards your opponent has in your hand. And they always know what you have in your hand. So you're getting that whole Onitama Duke chess-like feel where you know what every possibility is the opponent can do and they know what you have. 
Uh, something brilliant that was included in the game is there's a reference card for each character. But instead of that being for you, you give that to your opponent at the start of each match so they can look at what all your cards are at all times. Now, each of the 18 characters plays very differently. Uh, most of them have additional rules of some sort. So they'll have different cards or additional, they all have different cards, but there'll be additional cards or they'll have tokens or they'll have, there's all kinds of stuff, right? Like the one character I played uh, was an elemental fighter. So he had an earth token, an air token, a wind token, and a fire token. And he could bid those at the start of their turn to get bonuses. Um, Deanna's character was a robot and had armor tokens that she could use to block. Um, there are tokens for minions that can be summoned, teleport circles, like just out of the 18 characters, so it's crazy. There was a ton of stuff. There actually it's almost fiddly because there's like all the there's hex shaped ones and round ones and square ones, they all mean something different. Yeah, I love the idea of the variety of fighters and you know, looking at some of the art in this box looks really great, but if I feel like like the people who are into this really seem into it. And yeah. I feel like once you start buying more than one set or two, uh, you know, more one or two sets, it's going to get unwieldy really fast with all these bits and bobs yes. all over it. Uh, and I also noticed some sort of inconsistency with the art. Like they've got some some of the the, the character art in in larger form is really cool, but then it gets a little sort of almost eight bitty at times. Or I could be I'm not sure if that's what I'm seeing or if that's just fan art because there seems to be some of that mixed in. Um, that could be the whole classic edition versus the new edition. Uh, too. I'm not sure. So the, the the art we saw, at least in my set, seemed to be consistent. Okay. Now for organization, they did do something cool. And I've never seen these before. But there's these weird card holders that literally hold every card you need for one character. But there was nowhere to hold the tokens. Mm. So I think someone that's heavy into this is almost better off like investing in some kind of Plano system where you have the cards with the, the little card holder with all the tokens and stuff. And I can see it, but I got to say like 18 characters, how long would it take me to get sick of this? Right? Like I, I know people are into it and there's the whole being a complete completionist aspect, right? Like I'll admit, I kind of want to buy more sets. It was kind of neat. Um, but you don't really need multiple sets. Right. Well, I, I also noticed, I mean, but I mean, some people are really into this, like there are cosplayers for this and like, oh, yeah. it, there's, there is, there is a real movement behind. And I, and I don't know if it's battle, battle con specifically, or if it's actually Indines. the Indines. I think the Indines is, uh, uh, cause there's also like a pixel war or something mm -hmm. that's, uh, it's also got part of the Indines. Yeah. Every game level 99 games makes is in this setting. So, um, uh, Millennium Blades which you still have to try is, is it emulates going to a CCG tournament is set in the Indines. Like uh, they do um, boss monster. They do a bunch of stuff based on anime and eight bit and JRPGs. Okay. That's kind of their thing. So I do have to say when you're first learning the system, it's a bit overwhelming. Uh, there are a lot of different phases to a beat and man, the number of triggering actions and the timing. Like I, I had magic, the gathering flashbacks, like, Magic the Gathering tournaments arguing with people at the University of Windsor over what time their instant goes and whether the artifact acts first, right? Like it's it's that detailed, right? It's one of those. Now, I'm pleased to say that the rule book explains it very clearly. Uh, there wasn't any ambiguity. We never got to a point where I couldn't find the answer. And the board does spell out the different phases very well. So it does help that you can just look on the board. And by the time we played our second game, I didn't find myself having to reference anything. But I have a feeling that as soon as I grabbed a new character, I'd have to relearn it all again. Now, there was one problem, though. At least one card in my set still has an error in it from the classic edition. So Deanna was playing a character called Cadenza, and on Cadenza's reference card, it had the wrong stats for Cadenza's finishing move. And like wrong enough that it was seven points difference in damage. So it, it was a pretty heinous mistake. So at least some of the errors in the classic edition were not fixed in the remastered edition. And I don't know, like we happened to grab two characters out of 18, how many are wrong it does kind of concern me. Now, there is that other, I forget, already extended edition. Maybe they fixed that then. Well, we seem to be good at FAQs, so maybe we can get to this one down the line. <laughs> hey, if I keep playing BattleCon, maybe we'll keep it up, uh, which may happen, because overall, I had a surprisingly good time playing this with Deanna on the weekend. Um, based on reviews, I knew it would be good, right? This, I, I, it's not a game I would have paid any attention to. Ooh, 2D fighter card game doesn't scream out to me at all. But Tom Vassell still thinks it's one of his top games of all time, right? Like, that's a huge, 
name for um or a huge name backing this game right he swears by the devastation of in dimes version of the game so i haven't played that i don't know what makes that better than my war of in dimes version but whatever um i dig it i uh, i am actually looking forward to trying more characters plus getting some system mastery like this is definitely again it it recreates what it's trying to emulate you get better at those fighters you can master playing scorpion in mortal Kombat, and playing against a master of sub-zero is almost a mental match as much as a dexterity match and that's what this game manages to pull off so big props to level 99 games for that it's it's the same thing they managed to pull off with um i mentioned it a second ago millennium blades right like who thought they could simulate a magic the gathering tournament in a card game that's not a collectible card game and it works right like props to level 99 and it's a lot cheaper than feeding quarters into the upright down at the arcade (laughs) as uh, as you and i did quite a bit of uh back when those games came out very (sighs) true i played a lot oh street fighter 2 when i no it was street fighter 1 when i was in university every day for lunch i would go and i would have to put the top three scores had to say mo da orc every day and if it didn't i would have to fix that and i would go every day my mom gave me five dollars to buy lunch and actually what i bought was a nestle crunch bar for a buck a can of coke for a buck and the other three bucks went into street fighter don't tell my mom that (laughs) (laughs) though at this point she's much not much she could do about it uh and she is a patron she gets our that's true Uh, i don't know how uh, to listen to our bonus audio she's never uh, brought it up Ah, uh, so this week I have some good news as far as the pile of shame. It's going down, like literally going down. Um, Battlecom War of Indines is off the pile, and I I don't have any Kickstarter packages, so I did just buy a War uh, Architects of the West Kingdom, but that hasn't shown up yet, so that doesn't count. Plus, it may never show up based on who I bought it by from, but we're not going to get there into is that. that. So now that we've talked about what we played since the last update, is there anything you're looking forward to playing next week? No plans right now, but uh, I I need to sit down and uh, do a little terraforming Mars in case we uh, end up talking about it on Friday. Yeah, that's good. I still I installed it on Steam. I haven't (laughs) touched it yet. Yeah, I've only I did the I did the I've done one playthrough, so that's that's all I've done. I got I got to get that played at some point. Something to talk about. Yep. Now, with Deanna still recovering at her mom's, uh, as I mentioned, I've been grabbing two-player games, right, uh, to play. And I'm kind of taking this chance to get some two-player-only games off my pile of shame. Uh, So I've been spending some time learning or brushing up on the rules. Now, top of that list right now is Twilight Strongle. This game was number one on Board Game Geek for almost 10 years. Like, before Gloomhaven bumped it down, and um, no, it was Pandemic Legacy that finally dethroned it this game was up there forever it has been considered by many people to be the best game and still i think is rated the best two-player game on board game geek so i'm looking forward to that one uh the other one i'm working on is this one here polis fight for the hegemony which is a whole athens versus sparta thing um Deanna being a big fan of the Ancients, I think she'll dig both game uh, that game probably more than twilight struggle but the reviews on twilight struggle are just way too high now for those of you who did catch our loop back last week yes i got all excited about twilight imperium fourth edition obviously that didn't happen so that didn't that fell through um we were should have done that on saturday it didn't happen so it is still a possibility but now we're trying to work out scheduling um it's looking like it might fit in on june 1st so that may still happen And now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, and Bob every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Roger Meloche, thank you. Roger Linscott Jr., thanks. Brian Kurtz, thanks to our biggest fan. That's him saying that, not us. We love all our fans equally including our newest patron, Yuho Rutilia. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website, tabletopbellhop.com, for more gaming content. 
If you dig the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. <laughs>